And it's my pleasure to welcome uh, those from the community as well as students and faculty and alum uh, to Field and Graduate University's winter session. Uh, this is one of a number of evening events that we've had that uh, work on the theme of social justice, which is central to the mission of fielding. Um, two nights ago, we heard about um, the historical Jesus. Many of you were here um, as a social activist working for social justice. And tonight, we're focusing on the topic of homelessness. So um, before I introduce the panelists and set this in motion, um, I want to introduce Katrina Rogers, president of Fielding, who has a few welcoming remarks. Of course, you all know presidents always have something to say. So first of all, I do want to welcome all of you here tonight as part of Fielding's educational series in celebration of our 40th anniversary. So in the room, we have Fielding faculty and students and alumni, graduates, as well as community members. And we're all tied together by our common interests care and concern for many social issues, including what we're going to talk about tonight, which is homelessness in general terms and homelessness in Santa Barbara in particular. So I just want to welcome you to this event. And for those of you who may not know what Fielding is, we were born in Santa Barbara, as I said, 40 years ago in March 1974. And we focused on clinical psychology and later on on human and organizational development and then an education school as well. And what we always believed, and we still do to this day, is an understanding that graduate education for the adult learner is different than other kinds of graduate education, and that the adult learner has particular needs. And that's why you see our sign, and we say we're the best graduate school for adult learners. And that means that we believe in the power of learning to transform and help people be able to take their educations and go out in the world and create positive, lasting social change. So we are committed to social action um, in our vision and mission and through the work of our students and our faculty and our graduates. So again, welcome to this event tonight. I hope that we all learn a lot. I'm sure that we will. And I suspect our panelists will learn a lot because as is typical in Santa Barbara, we always ask great questions. So enjoy your time here and let's learn. So go ahead, Rich. Thank you. So uh, today began, uh, for those of us at Fielding, uh, with a tour of homeless and housing projects in Santa Barbara. We chartered the famous Santa Barbara trolley, sort of imitation, San Francisco trolley, and between 9.30 and 3.30, about 25 of us uh, were taken on a tour uh, by Rob Fredericks and Mickey Flex, a longtime community activist. In the morning, we visited a number of uh, homeless shelters, facilities. Uh, one was Transition House, which you'll hear about in a moment. Um, and in the afternoon, we visited many of the city's housing projects uh, for homeless, uh, for workers, for low-income people, for seniors. And you'll hear a lot about that, so I won't attempt to summarize, except to say that I have lived in the city for 42 years. I've been a committed, engaged activist, but I had no idea of the breadth and um, elegance of the approach to housing uh, for low income and homeless people that this area has. Scattered site housing all over the city. Uh, you wouldn't know a shelter or a low income housing project from the neighboring um, housing. Um, so I was blown away and impressed, as I think you will be tonight. Um, this effort grows out of one of the concentrations we have uh, for fielding students called Transformative Learning and Social Justice, which emphasizes the importance of the intersection of our own learning and growth and growth and development in the world outside of us. It really brings the two together, and today did so, I thought, beautifully. Um, so the format tonight is I will introduce all the panelists except the first speaker, um, one of our faculty, Valerie Bentz, will introduce Michael Wilson because she chaired his committee. And um, then we will have question and answer. And the way we're going to handle question and answer is um, cards uh, will be passed out or you have pads in front of you. Um, as questions occur to you, jot them down and we'll collect them and present them to the panelists at the end. 
Um, so let me begin in the order, introducing the panelists in the order in which um, they will present, with the exception of Michael Wilson, who I'll skip. Um, I'll begin with Doreen Farr. Doreen. Uh, Doreen was easily reelected to her second four-year term as our third district representative on the County Board of Supervisors in 2012. Uh, the third district, for those of you who are visitors to Santa Barbara, is a broad, highly diverse South Coast area that extends west of the city um, to include Goleta, the University of California, and the still pristine area up the coastline, which is still pristine largely because of Doreen and others' efforts uh, to keep it that way. <laughs> Coastal protection was one of Doreen's passions and one of her main responsibilities. Prior to her service on the Board of Supervisors, she had served on the County Planning Commission and as a consultant to the city of Goleta. She's also the lead person on the board to tackle the issue of homelessness in the county, having brought forward the plan that consolidates homeless services across numerous agencies and organizations, and we're gonna hear about that uh, tonight. Um, next, I wanna introduce Rob Fredericks, uh, to whom I owe a special debt, since he really made the trolley tour possible. He's done heroic service uh, on our behalf. Rob is Deputy Executive Director and the Chief Administrative Officer of the Santa Barbara City Housing Authority, where he has been since 1996. In addition to his many official duties and responsibilities, Rob is also President of the Southern California Chapter of the National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Officials and serves as a board member of Friendship Manor, a local nonprofit that owns and manages one of the largest affordable senior housing developments on the South Coast. Um, he gets much of the credit um, for Santa Barbara's showcase approach to affordable and low-income housing, as we saw on today's tour. Um, the authority currently provides over 3,200 units of low-rent housing and assistance to the South Coast. And um, I want to do a call out here, although he asked me not to do it, to Rob Pearson, who is the head of the Santa Barbara Housing Authority. And... Uh, <laughs> to whom this community owes an enormous uh, debt of appreciation uh, for all the great work that they have done. Uh, next, Helene Schneider, our mayor, was easily re-elected re to her second. <laughs> actually, I should say Santa Barbara mayor. There are actually a number of cities on the south coast here. Um, uh, Helene was easily re-elected to her second four-year term as mayor last November. Before that, she had served on the Santa Barbara City Council from 2004 to 2010. She represents the city and the Central Coast Collaborative on Homelessness, and there are some people in the audience I'll introduce you to later who are involved with that. And she is on the governing board of Bringing Our Community Home, the Santa Barbara Countywide Tenure Plan to End Chronic Homelessness. Helene also co-chairs the U.S. Conference of Mayors Task Force on Hunger and Homelessness, so she brings a national perspective. Uh, on this topic. Finally, I should add that she has served as president of the Santa Barbara Women's Political Committee, where she was on the board for several years. And to do a call to the Santa Barbara Women's Political Committee, um, it has been instrumental in shaping the politics of this area over the last two decades. Santa Barbara Women's Political Committee, Political Committee is in large part responsible for the fact that we have many women in leading political positions in this area. Our Congresswoman Lois Capps, our state uh, senator, um, Helene, uh, other, in addition to Doreen, others on the Board of Supervisor. Um, they've really played a leadership role in electing not only women, but progressive women committed to social justice and environmental sustainability. Let's have a round of applause <laughs> for that also. Uh, finally, Kathleen Boschke is the Executive Director of Transition House, a long-standing facility in our community that is dedicated to the solution of a particular aspect of homelessness, family homelessness. Its approach is based um, on the understanding, and I think that this is really important, that the root cause of family homelessness is poverty. Poverty is the problem, and poverty is the thing that really needs a solution. 
Kathleen has been involved with Homelessness and Transition House for two decades, first as a volunteer fundraiser and shelter manager, then on the board of directors and became the executive director in 2003. During her tenure, Transition House has completed several building projects, including a complete renovation of their emergency shelter and additional units of affordable housing. They used to be housed, as I recall, in a Quonset hut downtown. Now they have a magnificent facility, um, two facilities actually, including longer term uh, housing, which you'll hear about. Um, it has really expanded under her leadership and she is a gracious hostess to us today on our tour. Um, and now let me introduce Valerie Benz, who will introduce our first speaker, Michael Wilson. I've asked the speakers to keep their comments brief, 15 minutes if possible, hopefully, so we can have plenty of discussion and questions. Oh, I get 15 minutes to talk no, about... No, you get exactly as much as Okay, fine. <laughs> I'm very, very pleased to have the honor of introducing Dr. Michael Wilson. Recently, a new PhD from our program in human and organizational development. Michael exemplifies the kind of works that our doctoral students do best, combining, creating new theories and new ideas for social change and social justice, along with actually implementing and applying those ideas and bringing them into fruition. Michael Wilson is the founder and executive director of the Phoenix Drug and Alcohol Recovery and Education Society in the Vancouver area in BC. He's responsible for all of the operations of the society's programs, including residential services, integrated housing, education, criminal justice integration, workplace development, and community capacity building. The results of this scholar practitioner's work include the building and operation of two beautiful integrated facilities in the Vancouver area with a third one on its way. Both of the projects currently operating were developed by Michael and his agency and his wife Anne, soon to be Dr. the second Dr. Wilson. Indeed, Michael was invited to share his work this past November in China at the United Nations Conference on Cities. Integral to his work was the development of the theoretical basis for bringing together diverse public and private organizations involved in uh, the, the problems of homelessness and poverty in these lovely and success, successful projects that you will hear about from Michael. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, Honorable Mayor, um, I, I want to say that on behalf of our mayor, I just talked to our mayor uh, a couple of days said I'm coming down here and, uh, and uh, she sends her salutations to uh, you, the mayor, Santa Barbara, and to the residents here in Santa Barbara from uh, Surrey, British Columbia, from our mayor to you, the community. Um, and uh, she was very excited. Um, she's a visionary leader um, who wants to see balanced growth, uh, wants to see human flourishing in our community, and is very committed to working on all fronts. In fact, our city has a, 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 a she's just recently sponsored an innovation one mile innovation corridor where we're building out the new city. So it's science, technology, universities working together, um, building an innovation hub with fiber optics and technology and, and uh, geothermal uh, district energies and, and working very hard at uh, positioning our city as a, a global city uh, and uh, able to be competitive for its citizens. On the other hand, she's worked strategically with us in the social innovation space figuring out how do we build well-being into our city? How do we create a city in which humans flourish and we have an inclusive handout to the other? And so she is equally committed, and I understand you're doing national work on the same priority. So again, applause to, to you, uh, Mayor. And I, I was out today and I, I had a PowerPoint, significant PowerPoint presentation that I kept thinking I have to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, one, I was astonished by what I saw. And uh, you have a dedicated, hardworking people in this community who are doing extraordinary work at addressing the issues that are here. 
deeply impressed. One of, the, one of the things I talk about design, making a place uh, that all can call home, a place that we love, that we care about, where it's friendly and warm, and the possibilities that we can have that reality represented in communities. How does that come about? And I believe that our urban spaces and the design of cities has an integral part of that. What we saw today was extraordinary, great examples of wonderful design work. And so again, applaud to the county officials who have been working in the health authority and it was just wonderful to see the design work um, that uh, provides home for many of the vulnerable citizens that you have here. I, I'll, I'll talk about um, a little bit and I'll try to go through my slides very quickly um, because again, I, I think it's an opportunity to uh, hopefully excite and engage in conversations about issues that really matter today. Cities are strategic spaces in my view. Um, when I was in Hong Kong, uh, we have Euro cities that are really talking about how to, to address inclusive, inclusive cities. Um, there are cities in, in, in uh, China and Japan and other uh, Asian countries around the world that are similarly. Looking at the consolidated plan that you have here, the four-year plan, I thought I was reading a document in Surrey. Uh, the kinds of vulnerability, folks with disability, single parent mothers, people with addictions, I thought I was in Surrey for a minute. <laughs> I'm looking at the same kind of challenges that are taking place in local contexts, but are also, you're not alone in addressing those issues because they're global concerns. And cities that innovate, that work together, that collaborate, um, have a great chance of succeeding in the challenges ahead. Um, I just happen to come across because of the, as a result of our meeting today, um, up and coming is the uh, World Forum on housing and I thought that this is a great quote um, because it kind of connected with the heart. I think today's uh, tour really connected with the heart. And um, Jane Jacobs uh, gives a quote and the World of Inform is using it as a kind of banner for the uh, World Forum there. So cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. So this is, um, I know that uh, particularly in Western countries around the world, we know the, the consequences of globalization that we, and certainly in the West, we have an aging demographic. We have an aging infrastructure. Uh, while other economies are emerging, um, that there's tensions, and political tensions and good democratic dialogue and debate about these tensions and how to respond to what somebody referred to today as the human infrastructure against the hard infrastructure of the economy to be globally competitive. So these tensions and discussions and debates will be here, but again, we're focusing on housing. But I just want to recognize those tensions and the conversations and debates in great communities that uh, have a good democratic life can recognize those tensions and, uh, of course, engage in the kinds of debates that are necessary to realize a better future. I refer again to cities as strategic spaces. In our community, we have a snapshot here. As you saw in the first instance, our city's got uh, new towers going up in an innovation corridor, um, and yet we have um, literacy problems, educational problems, workforce development challenges, um, and the ability to how do we connect all of those issues in working in a collaborative space so that the city is a viable, ready city. Both workforce development, healthcare challenges, employment, housing, all of those are intersections that are being played out in cities around the world. Cities that are starting to get those things right are starting to see the conditions for flourishing. Again, the, uh, in keeping with the democratic tradition, the idea the future lives here is what our mayor says. I'm, I'm working from the social side of it, so I often ask the question, but what future and whose future for whom? And so that's often a good question to incite further discussion and, and dialogue. Um, my presentation briefly um, focuses on social innovation that's going to focus on social inclusion. So social innovation, just like science and technology and innovation, social innovation looks at dynamics and is understood in many different ways. We have social enterprises, we have various, various forms of understanding about what social innovation is, and I'm looking at social innovation in the context of taking exclusionary policies and turning them into inclusionary strategies. So I'm, I'm illustrating in our community just how we've taken exclusionary policies and began to work collaboratively to turn them into inclusionary strategies to address some of the more complex issues and needs in our community that have been unmet. Um, and developing new ways of thinking about uh, uh, the well-being of citizens and communities. And 
really we have to rethink um, in many cases in our country particularly because we have um, uh, health care issues that are unsustainable going into the future. Uh, many of our social safety nets are um, being challenged uh, because of the consequences of globalization and being globally competitive. And so this is really bringing in new ways of thinking and new ways of talking about how to make cities uh, great places to live and building the capacity of citizens and cities. Um, the Phoenix Center, again, I, when we saw about what is good design, uh, the particular population we were, and today we saw a whole continuum of housing issues that were being provided. Here we were looking at folks uh, that are very often seen in some um, quarters, uh, some of the public would call it a public nuisance. They're um, absolutely homeless, long-term chronic homeless, um, many of them with addiction issues, uh, poor attachment to the labor market, um, mental health challenges. In other words, they represent what might be termed many barriers to good living. And so we thought, well, how do you possibly, um, and they're very costly in the different registers. Uh, the health care costs are high. Um, uh, the facilities that they're in are very high. So the Phoenix Center represented, we went to the different governments. When we went at the time, we said we wanted to put the building together to design a space and a place that incorporated, that we wanted it to be a place where people would want to come, that citizens would want to come into the place where the homeless were, <laughs> um, where the addicted were. They'd want to come into that building. So how do you design a building where you want the community to get excited about coming in? And so how does the, what would the design look like for that kind of interaction and change to happen in a community? So the dividing, designing the space was critical to us. There are lots of amenity rooms. Uh, we have, for example, our credit union and our banking people come in and do financial literacy and, and, and do events where their grants happen in that space. And we rent them rooms to deliver that. We have the city planning department comes in and we provide food service while their planners work through stuff in some of our facilities. All these interactive, we hold community events of all kinds. So the build form itself is a place of community learning. And we wanted to design it as such. Also, um, so we have 28 addiction beds in this particular uh, for early stabilization. We have 36 studio apartments. We had a flower shop at the front of the building uh, that won the bid for the Olympics. It was a social enterprise. In fact, many people who said, well, this is for homeless, addicted people, um, is, am I in the right place? <laughs> because they encountered a flower shop um, and, um, and a coffee shop. And from there, they were just similarly impressed. Um, the design of this building here, there's four, seven, four stories of engineered glass. We broke all the design molds and we have no problems with the people. In fact, the very population characteristics that I described is that you have 50% employment outcomes and 30% training outcomes of that population who traditionally have been not predicted to be able to succeed in labor market attachments. And that has to do with a little bit of health care. We have a a physician on site. We have uh, the university community partnership with Kwantlen University, our local university, who do a couple of things. They provide academic upgrading. We have a workforce development program that is also occupying one of the spaces that's open to the community as well as residents. Um, as, and uh, we have a recreation center. We have a, um, uh, an Aboriginal sweat lodge in the back. And um, for indigenous people to participate in their ceremonies and their healing grounds. And um, again, it, it's a hub of activity that invites the community in to the space. Our partnership with the university uh, not only provides academic upgrading, but faculty donate their time under an idea called Humanities 101 that was originally uh, created here in the United States, um, and, but has been evolving from Mesereau's work. Uh, the idea that there's no surveillance and no examination yet. It's to take learners in who've had bad experiences in traditional education who may not walk into the door to the university. And uh, the, we have professors come in and they get a little bit of art, philosophy, uh, power and discourse in Foucault. And all they get to do at the end is they can get to tell it uh, in a wisdom circle at the end because our hope is that we can invite their imagination to think of possibilities. And so all of this learning and opportunity is going on in one place. Again, we link housing as a critical aspect to this process. And as you can see, uh, income security, social development, healthcare, labor force, immigration, development, 
and education. And so within the space itself, all those opportunities are available and uh, in the built form itself. Uh, these are the partnerships that we've, again, and again, we've looked at, if you look at all orders of government from the local government to the provincial government in our context, which would be the state, as well as the um, federal government and our intermediaries, financial institutions and local businesses, uh, including uh, credit unions, uh, real estate foundation, and other community partners uh, have made the investment in the center itself to make it possible to build it. So multiple partnerships across all orders and all scales uh, and across the vertical and horizontal aspects of the community. Um, what we call was working between the spaces and we think that innovation, there's many opportunities for us to meet the, the healthcare challenges, the inclusionary challenges, the workforce development challenges and they lie in the spaces between health and uh, housing and um, education. And so these new relationships and new possibilities occur out of the new collaborations and conversations that are happening in our community. Um, we use a sustainable livelihood framework as a way to um, look at growth and development and human development in the context of cities and, um, and uh, and it, it provides another set of measures as opposed to the GDP itself. So um, it, it indexes housing, health, and other related aspects that we can measure, human development and human pro uh, progress. Um, this is the next facility that we built. The first facility was $13 million. This one we just completed last year was another $18 million. Uh, we went green. This is a lead gold building um, with all the latest technology to deliver a lead gold project. And uh, again, it was a partnership with the city. Uh, we went to the city, they bought the land, um, and uh, then we brought in uh, our Fraser Health Authority, who became partners who are running a sobering center downstairs, and we operate, and we're the operator of the housing component and the addiction treatment component. Um, again, the emphasis here, that we've, the turn that we've taken in the discourse around poverty is to turn the people that we serve into citizens. And, um, and I'll just click through here. Spaces of dwelling, I'll give you some pictures really quickly. I got three minutes. So I'll get you to our last project. Here's a typical housing unit. Uh, they're about 325 square feet. Uh, these are the balconies, and again, when you design space, it's cedar balconies and, and things. This is our flower shop at the front of the building, our university program and upgrading our employment assistance program that's linked to workforce development, and our sweat lodge, our creative writing classes, um, our humanities program, and uh, this is creating community engagement for change. Some of our folks are entertaining there, some of our community partners. Uh, this is an event that we put on that com the community came to, Eat, Live, and Play Well. We're highlighting new ideas in the city around how to get involved in the environmental work that's happening in cities and new ways that families and citizens can engage their city and do the environmental stuff that's going on. So uh, Eat, Live, Play Well was uh, held in between the spaces, again, re reflecting the diversity and the excitement and interest. The organizers of this were the residents themselves. They're engaged citizens. We tell them that they make a difference that the community is looking for and as engaged citizens are strategic about what kinds of events they sponsor to make the public sphere an enjoyable space for all citizens of the city itself. So it's a different idea that changes identity about who the poor are and what they have to contribute. Again, there's some more ideas and um, I'm just gonna have a little environmental stuff. Those are the red shirts who are key in uh, organizing many community events and sponsoring many of the events in the community that are transforming the public space. Um, I won't go into the details, but again, it's, it's a chronic homelessness, but I want to give you a little figure here. In this country, you have data as well, and it's playing out in our country from a number of data sources. To continue to do nothing about poverty and homelessness, and particularly chronic homelessness, is 72,000 to 132,000 a year to continue to do nothing in other related costs. Our program here, with even without the employment outcomes that we talked about, just simply to house with the range of supports and services that we were offering are 13,000 a year. Now, we're getting 50% employment outcomes who become taxpayers. 
So begin to think about what's going on here. <laughs> yeah? um, I want to tell you that our last project, which is pretty creative, and, and again, we're looking to those solutions. This Rising Sun project, again, it's a criminal justice program, housing. We've got transition housing, and then we've got shared equity housing. Okay? And the shared equity housing is affordable housing for people to buy into. Say, so how did you do that? Well, we've got our, our credit union, Van City, is buying in to make the units affordable. How, how did they do, why would they be interested in doing that? Well, we have, we, we reduced our staffing on our criminal justice program, enabling us to carry the debt and giving them a premium on the loan. So we can deliver affordable housing through our partnership and creative financial strategies and working with our financial institutions. The other thing that we've done besides this housing project, right beside it is an all nation gallery with an aboriginal design and, and a social innovation space. And we've gotten from the city on unused hydro line access, we're putting a series of community gardens in there. Um, one that brings the community into all kinds of diverse communities can access things. The, we're partnering with the university to run the Social Innovation Center and the Applied Social Research. We're partnering with the university to run the All Nations Gallery and we're putting fair trade agreements to bring art into the city center from around the world. And the Sustainable Gardens is an opportunity for people who are building new apartments, people from all diverse backgrounds come into the thing. In the garden itself, along with the Innovation Gallery um, and the uh, open space, we have an assembly area where people can come and not only ride their bikes in, do some community gardening, take on some formal and informal learning at the gallery space, um, and we have an assembly area for informal festivals for all diverse interested community members. And that's it. Thank you. That was good. Well, all I can say to that, Michael, is wow. <laughs> <laughs> That is so impressive, and uh, I know that uh, we're going to take away from it um, so many wonderful ideas. Of course, uh, as you said, there's a lot of commonalities in, in the uh, experience that communities have with homelessness and how we're trying to approach it, but um, certainly you have put so much innovation and creativity and um, looked at all of it and put it together in a way that uh, that I haven't seen before. So perhaps the mayor has seen it in examples in other cities, but um, I have to say, I would love for you to sit down with our sheriff and talk about how we get this kind of money, because it would be great to be able to build these kinds of projects here. Um, with that, I'd like to say good evening to everybody that's here, and, and thank you for uh, attending and uh, tonight and learn more about the issue of homelessness in, in this county. Um, I thought for my part of the presentation tonight, I would just kind of try to give you a brief overview of what has been happening in Santa Barbara County uh, over the past five years since I joined the Board of Supervisors. Many of you may be familiar with most, if not all of it, because you have been involved uh, directly in, in some fashion. But I know that there are some of you in the audience um, who haven't been involved and are here to learn how, to, how, how you can help. When I was sworn in as third district county supervisor in January of 2009, I really knew very little about the issue of homelessness. My background in county government had uh, been pretty much dominated by uh, involvement in land use issues, particularly when I was on the county planning commission. And even though we saw and approved a number of housing projects that had uh, affordable housing in them and at least one special needs housing project, I really had no idea how housing fit into the overall need for services <coughs> for our most uh, needy and vulnerable residents. And I have to say that um, my perception of who is homeless in our county was quite limited. And uh, primarily to those people that you could uh, easily see on the streets of Santa Barbara, mainly men of an indeterminate age who would be on the freeway exits or on the park benches or, or camped in, in the bushes someplace. That very limited perception immediately came in for a major overhaul when I found that two of my additional assignments as a county supervisor were to represent the full board of supervisors on the South Coast Homeless Advisory Committee and bringing our community home the 10-year plan to end chronic homelessness. As I started attending those meetings, I soon learned that the homeless population here was much larger, much more diverse, much more spread out throughout the entire county, and that their need for a wide variety of services besides housing was extremely great. 
I also learned that there were a lot of people and groups who wanted to assist county and city government in this effort from the nonprofit, the philanthropic, and the faith communities. The problem was we didn't always agree on how we were going to define who was homeless, where they were located, how best to provide the services to them, how we prioritized those services to them, and of course, um, who was going to pay for them and how. These were all huge and ongoing questions that we grappled with uh, every month. However, uh, one of the major roadblocks to finding answers was that we just weren't coordinating well enough between these groups as well as county departments and city staff. Uh, when I went to these meetings, um, some people came to uh, all the meetings and then uh, some, some people didn't. Some people were just at, at each of the meetings. And uh, that was also true for county staff. And it was also, I think, frustrating for uh, members of the community and groups that wanted to be involved because they had issues they wanted to bring to us, they had problems that they wanted to resolve, uh, how best to assist the homeless, and they weren't really sure which meeting to go to and how to get their, their questions answered and the and this problem solved. To make matters even worse, the county had commissioned not one, but three homeless advisory committees not just one in the south, but one in Lompoc and one in the north. But the two others hardly ever met. So we really didn't have a good representation from really uh, on homeless issues from the whole northern half of the county. In fact, I think if Sylvia Bernard of Good Samaritan hadn't attended, we probably wouldn't have had uh, as much information as we did. So um, as the economic recession got worse and our funding sources for administrative support got even tighter, we knew we needed to start to look at a better organizational concept that was going to include everybody that wanted to help and at the same time maximize these limited resources to achieve this more coherent and collaborative strategy. And so over the next three years, that new organizational concept would evolve and eventually become the Central Coast Collaborative on Homelessness, or C3H. As some of you may know, county government is the level of government designated by law to be responsible for the care of the indigent. So certainly my job to be as strong an advocate as possible for funding and services at the Board of Supervisors. And this was particularly challenging because uh, in 2009, when I started on the board, uh, we started to have some very severe budget deficits that resulted in eliminating a lot of positions, cuts across the board, merging county departments. And of course, as we know, very sadly, as economic conditions get worse, um, the need for assistance for the indigent goes up right while the money starts to evaporate. So we all really had our work cut out for us, didn't we? The first uh, challenge that the advocates for the homeless brought to me uh, specifically was the issue for the need for emergency shelters during inclement weather. And the system in place at that time just didn't fit the need. It was very convoluted, it was complex, a set of rules and criteria that the county would have to follow to even consider opening up a shelter. So we really needed a system that was gonna be much more responsive and flexible and that the county could participate in and partner in, but didn't have to be in charge of so that we didn't get hamstrung by all of these impossible rules and regulations. The result was the uh, incredible partnership uh, that we now have called the Freedom Warming Centers. They are throughout the county under the guidance and administration of the Unitarian Society and of course with the strong support of the faith and philanthropic community and so many individuals who volunteer. The result was that during the winter of 10-11, the warming centers had eight locations throughout the county and served 1,736 people. But two years later, last winter, we had 10 sites that sheltered 4,182 people, an increase of over 240% in just a two-year period. We found that the warming centers not only helped to bring uh, homeless people in out of the cold, but was an opportunity for an organization like Doctors Without Walls to provide medical services and also for people that wanted to uh, assist the homeless in finding services and in finding housing to be able to engage with them. And many of the service providers found that they saw people in the warming centers that they had never seen before. So it was a really a great opportunity for outreach in a way that um, we hadn't necessarily had. 
And I think the success of that partnership also helped to build the momentum for creating a larger partnership uh, over the issue of homelessness. The Freedom Warming Centers were named because of a homeless man named Freedom who had died while living on the street. So one of the next big collaborative projects that we tackled was trying to quantify who was dying prematurely because they were homeless and what health issues they had suffered from. The county reinstituted our homeless death review team and under the leadership of public health and with the collaboration of uh, alcohol, drug, and mental health, the sheriff's department, social services, cottage hospital, Casa Esperanza, and parish nursing. And uh, they've now produced two reports on this issue which go into a lot of detail. Uh, and we learned, even though we knew it anecdotally, we had the hard data to say that the decedents were predominantly male. 80% uh, were Caucasian, 86% were U.S. citizens, and 14% were veterans. 46% died due to alcohol and drug abuse, 27% the cardiovascular disease, and the rest from a variety of causes. The average age at death is 52. Mental health conditions and duly diagnosed individuals represented a very large proportion of the population. And again, I think for people who had worked with the homeless community, these uh, statistics were not surprising, but they really provided an important service um, to, um, to have those statistics and also to publicize, I think, to the wider community just how serious a problem it was. And this was concerned, uh, confirmed by the point in time count just last year in January when 80% um, or 886 out of the 1,100 people were interviewed were deemed vulnerable and at risk for premature mortality. Um, again, uh, a wonderful collaboration across uh, county departments and with the community. Of course, we know that getting uh, the homeless into housing is the critical first step. And so uh, if some of you have been, had a chance to look at the C3H website, uh, just recently they've posted the, the statistics on how many people have been housed between last May and December. In that eight-month period, there were 208 total placements of 315 uh, total people housed, including 75 children and 97 that were uh, from that most vulnerable and chronically homeless list, and 49 veterans. And I really think that that's a, a wonderful achievement and a credit to then this collaboration that did come into being of the Central Coast Collaborative on Hopeless Homelessness, or C3H. Again, a merging of all the efforts that had been going on. Uh, in addition um, to the groups I already mentioned, um, there is a coordinating council which meets regularly and includes all pertinent county departments, including law enforcement. And I had a conversation with one of the assistant county CEOs today who was leading the meeting. There was a coordinating committee uh, meeting today. There were 50 people there. That, uh, in the past, was unprecedented. Um, and you know, she was telling me that to have that kind of participation, that kind of collaboration on a regular basis has really streamlined the coordination of information and delivery of services and really helps to resolve issues before they become problems. So um, that has proven to be something else that has worked out very well with the new organization. Myself and Supervisor Lavagnino, who represents the Santa Maria area and the 5th District, um, are the board's representatives on the Policy Council, which meets quarterly, and also includes elected officials from all of the cities throughout our county, including Mayor Schneider. And so for the first time, uh, we can make decisions about policy about all areas of the county with everybody participating. And so now we know better than ever uh, who are homeless, uh, that we need to serve, where they are, uh, and how do we help to transition them out of homeless homelessness using a multi-step, multi-service, and multi-agency process. Um, this is a much more targeted approach, and uh, it's just working so much better. I think as I look back on the last five years, I realize that um, besides these major efforts, that there have been a number of other related efforts that have been expanded or improved or created that have also helped uh, in our work with the homeless community. We've seen the growth of our treatment courts, including those for the homeless. This was new. We've seen increased services to the veterans in our community, including two amazing stand-down events in, in Santa Maria, 
uh, organized by Supervisor Lavagnino. We are now in the process of overhauling our alcohol, drug, and mental health department. We're exploring the possibility of more psychiatric beds in North County with a par possible partnership with Marion Medical Center. We've had, we've talked about housing earlier, but we've had any number of affordable housing projects approved, including some with the support of uh, supportive services as an integral component. And I have to say that despite all of the financial challenges uh, that we've experienced in this county over the last five years, that we have managed to keep um, our transitional shelters throughout the county uh, in operation. And um, even though we clearly need more spaces and more housing, the fact that we haven't lost spaces, I think, has been quite an achievement. We also need to look at more detox beds and really important, more transitional psychiatric facilities that are not the hospital emergency room, not the psychiatric health facility, and not a holding cell at the jail. So I've certainly learned a lot. I know now that the homeless are not primarily just men in Pershing Park. The homeless in our county are also the people living in San Jose Creek and along the San Inez River Bank, the families that are living in RVs and in cars, the seniors in, uh, in unsafe garages illegally converted in the Mission Hills area, and so many veterans living on the street with PTSD in Isla Vista and elsewhere. So we have a long way to go uh, to fund and implement the strategies. And again, uh, Michael, you've set the bar pretty high for us today. But um, I think that we really, really have made a lot of progress. So um, I have a, a sign on my desk that some of you, if you've been in my office, have seen that somebody gave to me a long time ago. It was taken from an old bumper sticker you might remember that says, uh, if the people lead, the leaders will follow. And I certainly have followed everybody in this community that uh, is so involved in this issue and comes out and supports these efforts and comes to the Board of Supervisors and helps me advocate with uh, the rest of the supervisors to support the needs in this area. I'm very proud to do this and I'm looking forward to continuing. Thank you very much. So it's, it's nice to see so many familiar faces in the audience, including my colleagues, uh, Alice Villarreal read it, and my boss, Rob Pearson. Uh, so if you have any real difficult questions, they're the ones that can answer it tonight. <laughs> they're much more well-equipped than I. I want to give you what the national setting is now uh, with regard to uh, homelessness. 47 million Americans are living below the federal poverty line. 640,000, that's the number of homeless people on any given night. 1.5 million people over the course of the year use emergency shelters or transitional housing programs. And 535,000 families with children are homeless over the course of the year. This, this cannot stand. I can't believe that we live in a country that does so many great things and then you look at these statistics and that's the shape of of the nation with regard to homelessness. We, we can do better, and we have to do better. In, in Santa Barbara, I want to give you just a, a, I apologize for those of you that were on the tour this morning. You're seeing a couple of slides that you already saw. Uh, on the south coast of Santa Barbara County, the total county population is uh, just over 400,000. It's split evenly between north and south county, uh, pretty evenly. At, we have 200,000 population on the south coast. The median home price is $802,000, uh, yet the median income uh, for a family of four is only $72,900. So that creates a really uh, a low housing affordability index and makes it really hard for anybody to afford a home, uh, to, to buy a home uh, on the South Coast. And uh, there's also the pressure of there's not enough uh, housing period, and that creates uh, upward pressure on rental housing in our community. The average price of a two-bedroom home on the South Coast is $1,900 a month. Uh, that's for a two-bedroom, and a household would need to earn 60, over $65,000 a year in order to qualify. And we have a, a large service industry here on the South Coast, and many people earn far below that. And we have a vacancy rate in the city of Santa Barbara that's less than 1%. 
it, in order to have a healthy community, you should have a vacancy rate that's around 5%. A 1%, less than 1% vacancy rate, really not even people that can afford the homes can have a home here. That's what the issue is. Um, it, it, and just to bring some more context at the affordability uh, issue, um, our housing authority uh, administers 2,366 Section 8 housing choice vouchers. Our wait list, we have over 7,500 people on the waiting list for those vouchers, and we can't serve them. Our, our program is fully utilized. Those people need housing now, and yet the, the waiting time, uh, the average waiting time is, is now growing to about seven years before we can serve people with a voucher. So it's, it's really horrendous, so you, you can understand why people are becoming homeless. Uh, also, over the past 30 years, we've lost about 600 downtown single room occupancy units through the uh, rede redevelopment of the downtown core area. It was an unintended consequence uh, where we had uh, the old hotels that uh, helped people to have a roof over their head that were living in the margins, and those are now gone, and uh, where we could have served people, uh, uh, 600 people, we can't serve them any longer. Also, um, it's been estimated, and I'll go over uh, what we found as far as the number of homeless, but it's been estimated in the past that uh, throughout the county, the, the homeless numbers are somewhere between three and 6,000 homeless in, in the county. And um, in 2009, Roger Haru uh, generated a report on homelessness for the county, and that report indicated that, that the homelessness throughout the county was costing 36 million per year. Uh, due to um, the revolving door of people going in and out of the prison system, going to the emergency room, accessing uh, health care through the, through the hospital and hospital stays, social services. Uh, annually, we have uh, 30 to 40 youth age out of foster care in our county, and 65% of those have no place to live. And those that age out of foster care within six months, 32% uh, end up homeless. So it's, it runs the gamut of as far as who becomes homeless in our, in our community. Doreen mentioned the, the homeless deaths report that the county has generated. In 2009, 40 people died on the streets of Santa Barbara uh, in, or throughout the county. In 2010, 39. That was kind of a wake-up moment for many of us uh, working on the affordable, affordable housing issues and homeless issues, and it was like, we, we have to change what we're doing. We're, we can't let people die on the streets. That's not right. Um, so uh, we did change. We, we looked at uh, the 100K homes model of, of not just enumerating the number of homeless every couple of years that's required by HUD, but really doing an in-depth survey, uh, finding out who the people were, finding out their names, finding out what, what, what their issues were health-wise, what's causing them to become homeless, and uh, try and really get the information to where we can properly tie housing to them. So the results of that vulnerability index survey uh, a year ago this month, uh, I want to go over that with you to give you some context of, of who we found and what they're suffering from. Apologize again for those of you locally that have seen this, but I think it's important information for the others to, to review and see. So our survey results, we encountered 1,466 people, and of those, 1,111 uh, surveys were completed. And of those surveys, as Dor Doreen mentioned, 80% were deemed to have an elevated risk of premature mortality because of their living conditions on the street and uh, health conditions due to, due to being homeless. And this is a listing of by region throughout the entire county of where we found people when we surveyed them. And you can see on the highlight there, Santa Barbara City proper really bears the burden of the number of homeless at 64.53% of those surveyed uh, were in Santa Barbara proper. 
Now we had uh, a cadre of volunteers doing these surveys. We have over we had 650 volunteers doing the survey countywide. So uh, we feel we got a, a really good cross section, and we and you can see there that that uh, the burden is is Santa Barbara, but there's other burdens as well. You can see um, uh, Lompoc has uh, 104 homeless, Santa Maria 300. Their living situation, 31% are living rough sleeping on the streets, not sheltered. 16% living in vehicles. 32% are sheltered in the, the emergency shelter system. And 12% uh, are living in transitional housing opportunities. Other general demographic information, 68% uh, uh, were male and 32% uh, female, 14% veterans. And you can see that um, Santa Barbara really follows the national statistics elsewhere throughout the country. We're not special. We, other places have the same issues and kind of the same demographics. In fact, you know Fresno has more homeless than Santa Barbara and you know those Try, try living unsheltered in Fresno in the winter or in the summer. That's pretty tough. The average age, 43. The oldest individual we surveyed was 84, living unsheltered out on the street. Youngest, 18. Average time homeless, 6.4 years. 14% had gone through the foster care system. Another 30% reported victims of violence or trauma while being homeless. And here's uh, some interesting statistics. There were uh, 732 ER visits uh, reported uh, in, the, in that year time and uh, 685 hospital admissions at, at a huge cost. Uh, and you look at the jail ad admissions, 72% uh, uh, indicated they had been in jail and at one time and prison another 25%. So there's a huge cost to our community uh, that we could, gosh, wouldn't it be better if we just provided a home for people like we do at El Carrillo uh, that people saw on the tour today that for about uh, 12 to $13,000 a year that provides a home and support on-site supportive services, that's a lot cheaper than putting people through the jail system. I thought this slide was kind of interesting too. Uh, you know, we wanted to find out if people had income and if they worked. And 15, uh, you know, 15 percent work on the books, another 12, 12 and a half work off the books. We have a lot of working people that are homeless. They just can't afford to uh, have a, a safe, decent, affordable home. And the health demographics. This is really important for us to be able to rank order file who is uh, most vulnerable, most at risk of dying at an early age, and we were able to to see who had multiple condi health conditions, and you can see that 51 percent of the survey responses uh, had uh, were have alcohol abuse issues, uh, 56 percent suffer from mental illness, um, 20 percent suffered traumatic brain uh, injury, 34 percent coronary artery disease. These are all exasperated by their living conditions, and um, that's why we had so many people dying on the streets. Uh, it, it's really tough to live on the street. So our findings from this survey um, are, are, were that the distribution of the homeless population and ratios were similar to what we did uh, two years previous. There were uh, continued uh, high self-reported rates of mental illness and substance abuse <coughs> and high levels of illness specific to homelessness, such as weather-related impacts and exposure to, to violence. And our findings did correlate to uh, national statistics. What have been our actions to date as far as, okay, we did this survey, right? We rank ordered file and you get people that you, you, you find who's most vulnerable. What, what are we doing about it? Well, we created a, a, a housing placement working group and that, that working group meets bi-weekly. 
And we, we work that list that we created from the survey, and we identify where the people are, who they are, and we try and match up the housing resources to them so we can get them off the street with appropriate services. And it's been really successful, as Doreen mentioned. And uh, um, we also, as Doreen said, we've created this new unified countywide organization called the Central Coast Collaborative on Homelessness, C3H for directing resources in a more efficient and appropriate manner. It's called, what's called a collective impact approach. It's kind of like you have a cart that needs to be pushed up a hill and you have a bunch of people that want to approach it and push it in different directions. The cart's not going to go anywhere. But now we get people working and, say, and agreeing that we need to go in this direction and the cart begins to move. So that's what we're doing with C3H on homelessness. And I won't go over the, all the intricacies, but we do have, as Doreen said, a policy council. We have a, a coordination committee that's comprised of decision makers that control resources throughout the county that can look at the specific issues and, and really put their resources to what's needed. And uh, we, we also have a housing shelter treatment subcomponent and a place for community action group, concerned members of the community to plug in and give us their concerns so they can be addressed. So the purpose of, of C3H is really to harness all the resources uh, available and reduce the number of people experiencing homelessness and minimize the impacts of homelessness in Santa Barbara County. And we have five pillars, um, only four showing again, sorry. I'll, tell you what the fifth is, but the, the five pillars are one, build a results and data-driven culture, really make good data-driven decisions, uh, support the expansion of housing for the homeless, prevent homelessness, elevate community dialogue, support and collaboration, and to create uh, um, uh, self-sufficiency through with those that are homeless and, and economic opportunities for people to, to change their lives and be on a successful path. That's the fifth component. Here, as Doreen said, are, are, are some of the hard statistics that we've been tracking since we uh, brought uh, a, a new model together in May to really report out the number of housing placement, placements countywide and um, 208 total placements uh, over the last eight months and 97 of those chronically <coughs> homeless, vulnerable, uh, at, really at risk of dying at an early age. So we've got them into housing, and that's a really good thing. Now, the takeaway. What do we need to do? We still have a lot of work to do. What I think we need, and what others that I talk to think we need, are flexible local dollars from cities and county general funds uh, to really implement housing programs and supportive services programs to get people off the streets. Uh, we can't continue to rely on diminishing federal funds that housing authorities are given. They're boxed in. They can't serve all the people. We need flexible local dollars. Philadelphia gets, I believe, $8 million a year flexible local funding that they're able to put towards homelessness. We need that in Santa Barbara County, more flexible dollars. We also, of course, as I mentioned, we need more affordable housing. And we've really been impacted with the... Uh, the revocation of redevelopment agencies in the state of California. Uh, nonprofit housing developers and uh, the housing authorities had relied on the redevelopment agencies to help fund affordable housing. That's now gone. So we need a replacement uh, for uh, uh, a permanent source of funding for the production of affordable housing. And uh, if you can take anything away, you need to support the, the funding of the National Housing Trust Fund that was enacted through the Housing and Economic Recovery Act of 2008, but never funded. That should be funded. Um, it could be funded through uh, mortgage interest deduction reform, which is a, could, is a whole session that I don't want to take up, but it's something that we need to look at seriously in this country. Uh, statewide, there's a, um, a bill floating through the state called the California Homes and Jobs Act that places a small transfer tax on real estate sales, non-residential real estate sales, that if that was enacted would, would create a, um, about $500 uh, uh, million dollars a year of funding that would make up for the, the funding that went away from redevelopment agencies. 
So that's what we, re what we need uh, to really be a success as far as funding goes. That's all I've got, thank you. Well, good evening, it's good to be here. This evening, I want to thank Fielding and, and uh, Mr. Apple, Dr. Applebaum for inviting me to be here today. Um, I'm going to see Mayor Nutter, the mayor of Philadelphia, in a couple of weeks at the U.S. Conference of Mayors meeting. I'll see how we can how we got eight million dollars out of his budget um, for for homeless services. And Dr. Wilson, welcome to Santa Barbara, and please give my regards to your mayor as well when you get back home. I thought I'd start really talking about cities. You know, a city is interesting in terms of what our role is with homelessness because unlike the county, we're not the social service arm, um, but we do interact with and have to uh, deal with homelessness on a variety of, in a variety of ways and look to innovative ways to try to deal with the impacts of it and also help, with, help people turn their lives around. Um, people ask me, what's your favorite part of being mayor? And one of my answers is I like connecting the dots. There are a lot of dots. Uh, and it's making, really making sure how to, as you know, in the position of mayor uh, at the city, you get to interact with so many different people. And you find out that a lot of people have the same interest and the same kind of uh, willingness to do something towards a certain cause, but they might not know each other. And so connecting those dots and making those things happen is, is much, very important. And as Rob was saying about collective impact, I think that's a big part of it too, is connecting those dots. It's allowing each stakeholder, no matter if they're coming from government or business or the philanthropic community or faith-based groups, let them do what they do best, communicate with each other and work in the same direction, uh, communicate very well and have a common goal and then measure your results. Uh, so that's a really big piece. I thought I'd, I would start with, thinking about two different individuals I encounter uh, in the city, uh, not their real names, but I'll mention them. One, her name is Lily, and she comes to public comment once in a while. I've known her ever since I was on the city council now 10 years ago. And uh, normally, you know, you see her around town hanging out in Delaguerre Plaza. She goes to city college here and there. She has a Section 8 voucher. And when things go well, I don't see much of her. But it's when that safety net kind of unravels. She's my canary in a coal mine. Uh, when, when somehow her, her interaction with her social worker is not working well, or the, um, she doesn't get a prescription that she needs, or someone steals her iPhone, or something like that, I see a lot of her. She'll come to my office, she'll cry, she'll just ramble on, she'll, you know, and I feel kind of helpless about, well, I can't really deal with you right now, except I need to connect you to the person who can. And it's when that, and, and so then hopefully that safety net kind of comes back together again. And then I just see her being very happy go lucky and taking classes again and, you know, doing things that Lily does. But again, sort of the canary in the coal mine of how that one individual can be a representation of the system. The other I'll call Sarah. And Sarah, I would see all the time. She actually has family locally, uh, lived on the streets had a big shopping cart, and you'd see her outside what was Borders uh, knitting on a regular basis. And people would walk by. I'd get emails about you know people hanging out on benches and things like that. Very sweet woman. And she'd also, uh, at night, would come to City Hall and plug in her laptop at the um, outlet outside City Hall to charge it up. Uh, so things like that. And you'd, and you'd see her on a regular basis, really try to keep to herself. But she, was very, she had a very big presence, not because she was a big woman and had a lot of stuff. And, and you'd see her around. But she wasn't necessarily in your face, but people noticed her. And people noticed her in a way that um, I would get emails in a negative way about what does this mean of going down State Street and seeing all these people hanging out on benches. Well, months would go by, and I remember at one point I realized I haven't seen Sarah in a while. And it, it, it made me click to say, you know, I didn't, something must have happened to Sarah because I stopped seeing her, and it had been a number of months. And actually, at one point, I asked um, Officer Hove, who's in the office here, who's one of our restorative police officers, what happened to her? And he said, well, you know, she got housing. She's at a, um, she's at a permanent supportive housing location, and, and she's doing great. And uh, a few months later, I actually went to that facility. They were having an event. And 
There she was outside her door knitting, and I was walking by. She goes, oh, hello, Mayor Schneider. How are you? You know, and she was, do she was doing the exact same thing as, as before, except instead of being outside Borders or outside City Hall, she was in her own home and had a safe place to be. And the thought of out of sight, out of mind, I think, comes into people's minds as well in terms of how do we interact as a community? What's the community um, response to all of this? Uh, we've heard a lot of great work that we're having here in Santa Barbara County. Uh, I came from the Housing Authority. I was a commissioner before getting on the city council and then as mayor. So, you know, seeing firsthand all the great resources we have, but again, making that bigger commitment to communicating this good work into the community is really quite important as well. Um, the restorative policing I wanted to mention, this is a program that uh, our police chief brought to Santa Barbara and actually a lot of other local agencies are talking to us about how we can, how they can replicate what we're doing. And basically what it is, it's, it's twofold. On a bigger level, all of our sworn officers are taught how to recognize mental illness, uh, especially in our homeless uh, community, and instead of just um, dealing with, you know, here's so-and-so, move along, move along, it's trying to connect them to services and recognize when they see something and how to make that connection. But in particular, the program, we have uh, three sworn officers full-time. This is what they do. They interact. They take a... a um, never give up attitude. They work with people who are on the streets, most of whom who have a significant uh, mental illness or substance abuse or are dual diagnosed in that way. And they do whatever it takes. Get them connected to social services, get them to restorative court, uh, whatever program, detox facilities. And of course, sometimes it takes 20 or 30 times or interactions for them to actually get things moving um, from a bench on State Street, for example, to a treatment center. And along with the three sworn officers are uh, three other uh, social, social workers who are non-sworn, but they report to the police officers who can do a lot of the time-consuming research and connectivity there. And then six uh, part-time community service liaisons, and they're in charge of being the face of, of State Street and downtown and, and um, the waterfront and Milpas, and connecting with the community, with business owners and so forth, and getting, keeping that connectivity and communication open. So that is something that we've seen some great success because even though, again, we're not the social service arm like a county, we get the 911 calls. When a business owner says there's someone hanging out in my doorstep, there's someone you know, being obnoxious outside, or there's someone just being there, we don't know what to do. Uh, we get the 911 calls and we have to interact and as, opposed to, as opposed to a revolving door between panhandling, going to jail, or having someone have a, a, a relapse issue and going to the uh, emergency room, here's a way of trying to really push forward and, and change people's lives around. And actually, our 2013 stats show that the new placements in 2013, people within City of Santa Barbara, there were 127 of them. Uh, 50 of people were reunified with family or friends either here or outside the area where they reconnected with people that they weren't connected with before and 28 were assisted through the VA as well so 28 veterans uh, and that's just um, and again the data that we're talking about how much is that is coordinated with the county stuff we're working on that and trying to you know measure that data in a way that we can measure results and see what thing where where's work what's working um, C3H has been talked about quite a bit, so I don't need to go into more detail about that, although I think the major difference, in my opinion, about this collaborative versus the 10-year plan to end chronic homelessness, the intent has been the same. A lot of the processes about housing first model has been the same. The main difference is that now the cities and the county are actually funding the administration of it. The 10-year plan process was um, there in in it was there in, in writing, it was, has a program, it had a booklet, it had a plan, but there was no backing of funding from government. And that in and of itself, I think, has created a big impact in terms of then the city staff and the county staff and all the inter, uh, stakeholders really feeling like they have to be, a, they need to be a part of it because they're funding it and they're vested in it in that way. Um, it was, as was mentioned, I was um, appointed to be co-chair of the U.S. Conference of Mayors Task Force on Hunger and Homelessness. And so I thought I'd give a little uh, broader national picture about how mayors look at this throughout the country. And there are actually quite a few similarities. 
Each year, the U.S. Conference of Mayors puts together a survey on hunger and homelessness, and they survey 25 cities. And so this last one, there ranges from large cities like Los Angeles, Chicago, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, more medium-sized cities such as Denver, Boston, Dallas, um, Philadelphia, and Phoenix, and then smaller ones like ourselves here, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, Charleston, South Carolina, Nashville, and Des Moines. So there's just a sample. And the survey showed that over the past year, the number of families experiencing homelessness increased across the survey cities by an average of 4%. 64% of the cities reporting an increase and 8% reporting no change from the previous year. So still seeing this slow recovery out of the recession um, and homelessness being a big factor. The number of unaccompanied, unaccompanied individuals uh, experiencing homelessness increased across the survey cities by an average of 4%, as I mentioned. Um, and poverty, officials say, was the leading cause of homelessness, is particularly dealing with unemployment. And other causes lacked were lack of affordable housing and substance abuse. The, uh, across the survey cities this past year, an average of 22% of homeless persons needing assistance did not receive it because no beds were available to them. And emergency shelters in 71% of the survey cities must turn away homeless families with children. Emergency shelters in two-thirds of the cities must turn away unaccompanied adult adults. On top of that, we're looking in Congress with sequestration and other types of cuts, and the one in the particular we were looking at was SNAP, which is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, formerly known as food stamps. And that, those kind of cuts in particular are leading to more hunger, which then leads to homelessness. And the nice thing, nice, but you know, the important thing of mayors coming together on a national level is being able to go to DC and talk about Cities, large and small, Republican mayors, Democratic mayors, doesn't matter. They're major issues related to federal funding and federal policies that affect each and every one of us in cities, and we come united talking about those particular issues. And um, the cuts in SNAP in particular, and Section 8 and community development block grants have been high, high up on the U.S. Conference of Mayors priority list. So in, in our own area, I uh, mentioned CDBG, which is Community Development Block Grants. Uh, which we get as a city, uh, it's slowly been declining. Uh, this is through the HUD or the Housing Urban Development Department from the feds. Uh, but what the city, our city did for a long time now, which has actually been quite exciting, is supplement the funding from our general fund. So it's not quite $8 million, but about $700,000 go directly to, through our Human Services Committee to talk about and, and grant directly to nonprofits to provide those services. Uh, it's, a, it's a competitive grant process. There's always more need than the funding available, um, but there's that piece that to supplement the CDBG grants, our Human Services funding. Um, on top of that, there's, there's particular infra, um, monies that go directly to our shelter services. I want to mention one particular uh, shining example of how I thought collective impact worked in our city, and that had to do with the need to open a new detox facility in, uh, in South Santa Barbara County. We had a program at one of the shelters, Casa Esperanza, which many of you may have uh, toured today, and there were um, 16, is that right, 12 beds, there are 12 beds, and separated uh, by men and women per code. And there was a waiting list quite a bit. And it used to, and so if there were more than six men that needed detox uh, services, and this is ser these are services for people who are uninsured or underinsured or who are homeless, um, you couldn't mix men and women in a room. So we would have a situation where maybe we had eight men and they took up both rooms and a woman needed uh, detox services. We ended up shipping them off to Lompoc or Santa Maria for a 14-day intensive detox care and then try to bring her back home to rehabilitate and, and move on with her life. Obviously, that was not um, a good thing to do. And on top of that, the shelter needed the space to really focus on their core services. And it really wasn't a great place to become sober, because a lot of the clients area were, at that time, um, not. So that was an issue. So here was a situation. We needed a new place. And this was a time when the city had a redevelopment agency and funding to, um, for capital services. And the city, acting as the redevelopment agency, worked with the City Housing Authority Commission, who hired a realtor to find a spot within 
our, our zone where we were allowed to purchase a facility. The city funded it by giving the money to the housing authority. They in turn um, are the landlord. They found the site, they rehab the site, and they lease it to CADA, the Council on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse, who runs the detox program and that program is funded through the county alcohol, drug, and mental health services. So see each different stakeholder focusing on what they knew what to do and how to do it and letting the others do their job in order to, for that collective impact. Since January 1st, 2012, when it opened, um, there have been 298 clients served there. 70% of them have successfully discharged to aftercare, so 208 individuals. 106 individuals, or 36%, were homeless when they, when they went into the program, and 55% of those, or 58 of those, had a better housing opportunity when they, were, when they left than when they came in, and, hope, and certainly um, being sober was uh, helpful for them. So I think that's just one great example of what, what can happen. So I want to end um, with a little more of a reality check. Um, we've talked a lot about, all of us talked about how, what, amazing work is happening in our area, how many people we're serving, there's still a great need. But there's also that community connection that needs to happen. There's also the political will. And um, I need to read some emails that city council members get on a pretty regular basis because I think it gives you an idea of this is the kind of feedback and impact we get as an elected official and how do we then respond, knowing all the good things that are happening. Some of it's not exactly nice to read, but I think it's important to know what, what the people's perceptions are, and their perceptions are reality. So here's one. First of all, I love Santa Barbara area. We were married in Montecito in 2007. We come back as frequently as possible. However, as a longtime visitor from the San Diego area, I'd like to address an ongoing concern that I believe is getting steadily worse over time. The homeless situation on State Street's gotten to the point of deplorable. Young men urinating, cursing in front of my four-year-old, aggressive panhandling, peddling for money. We've gotten to the point of not visiting downtown next time due to this very unbecoming environment. Another one, I'm a 24-year-old female resident of Santa Barbara. I'm concerned for my safety and the safety of my female friends and coworkers due to the overwhelming presence of aggressive and hostile homeless individuals on State Street. I can expect to feel merely uncomfortable on a good day walking to and from work, and on a bad day, I get aggressively harassed. I feel anxiety. Another one, every time we go to State Street, we are accosted. Where's the police? Right? Another one, dear Ms. Schneider, by all accounts, you seem to be a thoughtful individual, but I just had to tell you, as I'm sure you've heard before, the homeless situation is so out of hand. State Street is simply a disgrace. I truly can't believe your locals aren't more angry. It's such a shame because your town could be one of the finest in the world, and now it's just a joke. And finally, I'm totally disgusted by the way Santa Barbara is allowing drug addicts to hang out on streets in your city where families, locals, and tourists visit, shop, and eat. Thanks for the memories. And I, you know, and, and, you know, you read these, and this is, we, I think as a council, we get these probably, I would say, four or five times a month uh, from residents or from outside visitors. And, of course, the Chamber of Commerce hears this, business hears this. And it's not to say nothing's happening. There's so much going on. And so I go back to Sarah, the woman who I saw a lot, and I didn't realize she got help because she was no longer there. And it's the out of sight, out of mind situation. And we can't forget that we have so, much great, so many great things going on, and we must get that message out to the community so they know that we're not just turning our backs, that we're working on things, that it is a challenging situation, that cities around this country are experiencing the same thing, that we are not alone here, and that only by together, by working on good policies and good funding mechanisms, can we change this around and so we don't get emails like that ever again. So with that, I thank you for your time and uh, thank you for it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, probably most of you know that Transition House is just one of several shelter programs that operate in our county. And each of um, these mm -hmm. programs serves a specific demographic in their own geographic region. Transition House is a three-stage emergency shelter and long-term transitional permanent housing program serving Santa Barbara area families with children exclusively. The primary cause for homelessness for families is poverty. 
Transition House offers a full continuum of programmatic services designed to address all aspects of the economic disadvantages suffered by families that lose their housing. Transition House was founded in 1984 by a consortium of 12 faith-based communities in response to the growing epidemic of homelessness experienced both locally and on the national stage. For, for, for two years, homeless families and individuals were housed in church basements with volunteers from the community providing meals and support. In 1986, Transition House became a 501c3 nonprofit, found dedicated shelter space, and hired staff. Transition House serves families with children in highly at-risk, low-income low -income households from the Santa Barbara area with shelter, food, clothing, education, health care, career development services, and rental assistance. Stage one of our comprehensive anti-poverty program begins with a 90-day stay at our emergency shelter, where families recover from crisis, establish realistic goals with their case manager's help, gain or improve employment income, and start saving money. Stage two offers six months of transitional housing at a separate facility called the Firehouse, where families pursue education and employment goals and continue saving money. After a successful firehouse stay, families needing more time may continue to our third stage housing program for up to two years or more in affordable apartment units owned by the agency. Continued case management is provided. Crit critical to our shelter clients' success in achieving permanent housing are our family support services. Parents can enroll in a variety of free on-site classes such as career development, English as a second language, computer skills, and parenting. Infants receive care at our licensed infant care center, and school children participate in specialized homework help and evening enrichment and literacy programs that aim to break the cycle of poverty for children who are at highest risk of becoming homeless as adults. Finally, very low-income community households facing eviction that meet strict eligibility criteria can receive emergency rental assistance and case management through our homelessness prevention program. The program is designed to help develop financial literacy and sound goal setting and decision making to achieve lasting housing stability. Transition houses programs are successful. 70% of families that enter the emergency shelter exit to permanent housing. 86% of adults are able to obtain, maintain, or increase their income despite experiencing homelessness. Transition House has built its programmatic interventions and housing solutions over the years in direct response to the needs demonstrated by our clients and the unique socioeconomic circumstances of our area, the resources provided by our colleagues and partner agencies, as well as the contributions of our volunteers. In the early years, we relied heavily on volunteers to provide services. We had not yet developed a funding base to provide enough paid staff. We realized that we had to get parents back to work, but in order to do that, initially they needed free childcare, so we built a licensed on-site infant care center. Many of our clients had little job experience, so we designed a career development department that worked with folks to identify their particular skill sets and direct them towards employment opportunities that would utilize those skills and provide opportunity for income growth. We also realized 14 years ago that knowing how to operate a computer lab was vital for almost any job our clients might apply for. So we built a computer lab from local donations so families could learn these skills. Our leadership over the years has been keen to realize what services our agency should offer and what we should rely on others with more expertise to provide. We do not provide on-site recovery services or clinical counseling, for example but work with other area agencies to provide these services. Instead, our case management focuses largely on imparting life skills, particularly financial literacy, to our clients. And as much as it is important to help improve a family's income, it is also critical to teach families how to live within their means, set short and long-term goals, and build a saving safety net to protect the family in the future. We continue to rely heavily on volunteers, and almost 1,000 community members support Transition House each year, providing food service in our shelter, helping with child care while parents are attending evening classes, and working on fundraising and administrative projects. Perhaps the most significant response to local conditions our agency has made was to commit ourselves in the late 1990s to developing more affordable housing. 
We are fortunate to have a very close partnership with the Housing Authority of the City of Santa Barbara and the City's Community Development Department. With their help, we have been able to build or acquire 35 apartment units. The lack of affordable housing for Santa Barbara's low wage earners is still the biggest problem our area faces in combating homelessness. Transition House works closely with other shelters in our county, making referrals, sharing resources, creating best practices trainings together, and working hard not to duplicate efforts. To this end, both our executive staff and our program delivery staff meets with our counterparts on a regular basis. Over the last 30 years, homelessness service, pro service providers have moved from the mission of keeping people alive by simply sheltering and feeding them to crafting meaningful and successful programs to end homelessness. While this has created positive outcomes for many who experience homelessness, it has also placed the burden on our industry of ultimately being responsible for addressing the consequences of economic trends and decisions made by government entities at the federal level that are beyond our control. Minimum wage in this country is not kept pace with the rise in housing costs. HUD's resource commitment to public housing is, in today's dollars, one-third of what it was in the mid-1970s. In addition, cuts in funding for mental health services have had de devastating consequences. While the shelter system in Santa Barbara and across the nation will continue to develop more effective and efficient programs, we cannot eradicate homelessness without the will of both citizens and policymakers to recognize the sources of extreme poverty in this country and take the action necessary to alleviate it. I appreciate all of you coming out tonight and taking the time to educate yourselves on this issue. It is critical for people who suffer from homelessness. Thank you. I want to first acknowledge that these are all heroic people who are swimming upstream um, against a very strong current. And your comments, Kathleen, at the end really capture that, I think, quite perfectly. Uh, there are a number of people in the audience that I want not only to acknowledge, but because they were mentioned, um, call on them maybe to say just a couple of words about their specific projects. Um, Glenn, are you still here, Glenn Batchelor? Um, so Glenn is with Social Venture Partners, and they are involved in this uh, event that you see up here. If you could just come to the microphone and say a couple of words. You're probably wondering why this slide has been up there for the last 20 minutes or so, and I'm, I'll tell you. Um, I'm with Social Venture Partners, and we provide uh, money and consulting to local nonprofits, and one of the areas that we focus on is homelessness. And uh, we are going to be the lead sponsor, working with a number of other organizations, C3H, uh, UCSB, um, McCune Foundation, uh, Santa Barbara Foundation, to put together an, an event on the end of fe February called the Homelessness Action Summit. And the, the whole idea of this was that, you know, we've talked about the homeless count that we do every two years. We get 600 people out there. We get all this energy. We get all this spotlight on this issue. And a lot of good things come from it. But also, a lot of that energy and volunteerism and whatever dissipates a bit over between those two years. And what we want to try to do is bridge that two-year period with an event that really brings that energy back. And so the, this, this, uh, that, so that's really the concept. And the idea is going to be that there's going to be an afternoon session for people, uh, for providers, invitation only, um, where there's going to be workshops and training to, to help people do what they do every day. So it's going to be hands-on working. And then at night, there's going to be an event for the public. And we are very, very fortunate to have two of arguably the leading speakers in the country on homelessness, Philip Mangano, who was the federal czar on homelessness for seven years in the Bush and in beginning of the Obama administration, uh, and also Becky Canis, who is a co-founder and leader of the 100,000 Homes Campaign. And really, the focus of the evening event is going to be uh, largely on the latest of what works. And we've heard tonight about a lot of good things happening here, but there are thousands of counties across the country that are dealing with a lot of the same issues. And there's probably a few good ideas out there. And Philip and Becky and others um, work with hundreds of these communities um, that are doing some of this work. And wouldn't it be great to learn from that and bring some of that to Santa Barbara? 
We're also going to have a couple of um, California communities, spoke, spokespeople from other California communities come. And the reason for that is, is that the reality is there's a lot more homelessness in California than there is in other parts of the country. So it isn't, it's a little bit of apples and oranges, if you will. And a lot of those communities also have high housing prices, prices and also have low vacancy rates. But, there, but some of them are making big progress too. So wouldn't it be good to learn about that as well? So that's the whole idea of it. What's the latest? Uh, it's February 24th. You'll be hearing more information about it in the future. And uh, again, I want to thank everybody, uh, for the fielding and for the speakers for doing a great job tonight and for all of you coming out for caring. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Glenn. I also want to acknowledge Michelle Bruner, who's with Social Venture Partners, and Gary and Mary Becker, I believe you also. Um, and uh, Mickey Flax, who I just saw, who co-hosted our bus tour. Mickey? No. Uh, Mickey is an old friend of mine, so uh, she understands. I just wanted to acknowledge Mickey has been a major force in progressive politics in Santa Barbara for the last 40 years and is uh, on the county um, housing commission dealing with affordable housing. Um, let's see, uh, who else? Well, there are a number of people here from the Central Coast Collaborative on Homelessness, which Rob talked extensively about. Angela, are you still here? Angela and Zara Nahar Brown and Jeff Schaffer. Do one of you want to say anything additional, add anything to what was said already? You need help, you need volunteers. Uh, we also heard, heard about Santa Barbara Restorative Court, Restorative Police, and Maureen Brown and Kelt Hove, Officer Hove are both here. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about how all that works. Good evening, there's about half of us left now, I noticed. Um, I'm Officer Hove, I work with the Santa Barbara Police Department. I'm one of the little dots, proud to work for the mayor. And when, when these people blow up and they have issues that make it that they can't function in their normal everyday life in the way that they like to trans transverse through their goals and so forth, when they can no longer go towards those goals, we get all the outcome of that. We get calls for service from the general public that's saying, hey, this is not okay. This person is behaving in a way that's not acceptable, and we have to go fix that as police officers. When we go on trying to fix something that's not really fixable at that moment, you're left with having to come up with creative, uh, creative solutions, and, and those are hard to find when you don't have the resources that nobody else has either, but you gotta make it stop within five, 10 minutes. So then they have legal tools that we can use to make that behavior stop. But that legal use of those tools is not really what fixes the long-term problem that that individual, uh, that individual has. So therefore, it becomes a jail incar in, in incarceration, it becomes a shoo them on to the next problem, and then we're sure enough to get that phone call later on going, well, now he's over here, now he's doing this, now he's doing that. So some years ago, um, we began a little kind of uh, test kitchen approach to what can you do differently? What if we were to take this individual and cooperate with a bunch of other people that also have this person as a client, consumer, customer, friend, or whatever the politically correct term is for that individual organization to deal with that person? We all have that person and is affected by that person, and that person depends on us in one way or another for one capacity or another or many more. So we began going, well, what happens with so-and-so when so-and-so needs funding? Housing, medical attention, needs to get off of alcohol, drugs, needs to get off an environment where they're being pimped out by somebody else who is benefiting in, pre in a predatorial way from what they is experiencing as a weakness in their life that they can't handle themselves. So we began looking at what do we do with somebody like this? Well, I deal with the people that are at the very bottom of the social rung. We deal with people that are living on the sidewalks and for most of us, that's hard to understand what that means. It doesn't just mean, it doesn't just mean that we are at that moment 
um, inconvenienced. I heard the, I heard the age of, what is it, was it 52? 52 is the, for, for the age of, of uh, average uh, lifespan for somebody. Well, that number sounds shocking. But when you think of the number 52, you make it more shocking by looking at that individual's quality of life for the 30 years before the 52 when that person perishes. I got to deal with and see that person and work with that person in the last 30 years of his life, and, and it's not pretty. That person is suffering through that 30 years of living that lifestyle that is always going to continue to be unless somebody takes an extra effort to make them move on to the next level of support and services. So what is it we do with the, with the restorative policing? We take them and say, this is not criminal. This is a lifestyle that, you, that you've fallen into, perhaps a little, un, maybe it's your fault some of the times, maybe you're not taking the office that are being handed, but I don't care, it's, it doesn't matter. If you are doing nu nuisance crimes or nuisance type crimes, um, urinating in public, sleeping in public, doing things in public, getting, you, you're acting out because your mental illness is, is, is acting up because you're not getting the appropriate medication and attention, then we take those crimes and say, let's forget about this. Let's set them aside for a moment. Come play with me. Let me play with you, however you want to see it. What do you want? Whatever you want to go to, I will make that happen for you. I'm going to be your little dream foundation here. I'm going to make you get into detox if that's where you want to go to. I want to help you get into housing. The problem is when I go to those places, they go, no, well, we can't take him because he's been there before and he violated certain house rules. Then I sanitize them and get them into those places where they can no longer say no. So I take the people from the street, sanitize them. It may sound crude, but I'm speaking real fast. It will take me two hours to explain it otherwise. <laughs> sanitize it, bring them to the next level and go, here he is. You said he had to look like this. Now he looks like this. Then they say, well, you know, we're not quite sure. And I go, what are you not sure about? Tell me what you're not sure about. I'll help you get sure. <laughs> then as we follow them in through the system, they begin to have those relapses that make it that they live for 30 years in the street. Those are to be expected. So when they happen, everybody goes, well, you know what? We thought that was going to happen, and we, we, we took a chance, but it happened, so now he's out again. And I go, no, oh, wait, 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 wait. He doesn't have to go all the way to the bottom again. I get that he messed up. He doesn't have to go to the bottom. He can go a level down, and then you rise again to the highest level of your competency, which is you may not be able to live in your own place. You may be able to live in a place with five people in the room because then you have structure, support, and so on. You may not be able to live with, the, with your choices whether you should drink that night or not. You may need to live in a sober living house. So we try it, we bring you up, you come to a point where you fall, we, I don't let you fall to the bottom again, never. Never should you go to the bottom. And in the last three to five years, we had about 170 clients, customers, friends come through restorative court where we take their charges and for six months if they don't have any further charges because we help them get where they want to go. If they don't have any charges, we throw them away. Charges are set aside. We don't care about the charges. Who in here cares about somebody getting a $50 ticket for peeing in public when they live outside? Nobody. Nobody wants to hang on to that. But if it stops him from moving forward and it risks that he has to go to jail over and over again on the same silly thing that's not being stopped, it's ridiculous. And it, it taxes the system financially. It taxes the jails, <coughs> space-wise and so forth. If we can take these people that are falling into this lifestyle and move them up forward, they can be self-sufficient and they have a quality of life that's far beyond what they're experiencing at the current moment. And that's what we try and do. Okay. So. That was uh, inspiring, thank you. There's one more person I'd like to re uh, recognize here, my friend Mary Louise Scully from Santa Barbara Street Medicine. Um, a local hero. Um, we technically end in three minutes, which doesn't leave a whole lot of time uh, for questions. So maybe what I'll do is um, I will end now, and if the panel wants to hang around a little bit for people who come up, I just want to say one thing by way of conclusion, apart from thanking our panelists for an amazing presentation and uh, their incredible dedication to these issues in many different ways. Let's hear it for
Uh, my closing thought is this, not that anyone asked me to have a closing thought on this. Um, 30 years ago, the issue of homelessness appeared on the scene. There have always been homeless. Uh, but it became known because a book was written by a guy named Mitch Snyder. It was called The Long March to Nowhere, if I recall correctly. And Mitch Snyder was an activist, an advocate in Washington, D.C., um, <coughs> who was tireless um, in his effort to put this on the national consciousness. Um, he went on many hunger strikes and eventually got a shelter a former military, I think, facility in Washington converted to a shelter. And for a while, homelessness was a big issue. That was 30 years ago. And what strikes me is 30 years later, we have the same problem. And we have the same problem as strong now as it was then. And I just hearken back to something, Kathleen, that you said. Um, these are amazing efforts that many people put in, including all the volunteers in this community and in the many communities, Helene, that you identified, where mayors, Republicans, and Democrats are concerned about this. But it really will take a major change, I think, um, in our country and in our government to deal with issues of poverty and homelessness. Um, these are small cures for a big problem. And thank you so much for taking the cure. Thank you.